Hello and welcome to Folklore of the Universe. My name's Kyle, I'm your host. This is a podcast that's all about, you guessed it, folklore. So a very literal name. Uh, If you came here expecting something else like extreme monster truck racing, then we don't have that here, I'm sorry. But stick around and maybe you'll enjoy this anyway. So the format of the show, what's going to happen here, is I'm going to read off a few folklore stories every episode from all around the world and all sorts of different cultures. Then after each one, I'm going to talk about it. So interesting details, things that stand out, things that tie in with other stories, then also just general things like the creatures and spirits and magic and heroes and all the other things that show up in these. So if you're interested in folklore and stories from different cultures, then hopefully you'll enjoy this. Now to kick us off, I'm going to start with a couple of stories from the Brothers Grimm collection, because these ones are probably fairly familiar to most of you. That being said, the modern adaptations you'll see are quite a bit different from the original stories. The original ones are a lot darker, they're a lot more violent, and they're just a lot weirder in general. So a lot of these ones are probably not going to be what you're expecting, it's going to be something new. Just a bit of historical context before we start. The Brothers Grimm were these two brothers, whose name was Grimm, it's also a very literal naming scheme. They lived in the early 1800s and collected all of these folk tales and fairy stories from around what is now Germany, and they compiled all of those into one nice big convenient book. Of course, the stories themselves are a lot older than this and date back a very, very, very long time. Which is probably why they're so weird, because, you know, back in caveman times, stuff like people talking to animals and bits of string and charcoal going on great adventures together, you know, that made sense. That was just the norm. Either that or Caveman Joe was on some pretty strong psychedelic rocks. You know, either one. But that's enough of me rambling. Let's get started. I'm going to start with the very first story in the Brothers Grimm collection. This one is called The Frog King, or Iron Henry. In old times, when wishing still helps one, there lived a king whose daughters were all beautiful, but the youngest was so beautiful that the sun itself, which is seen so much, was astonished whenever it shone in her face. Close by the king's castle lay a great dark forest, and under an old lime tree in the forest was a well, and when the day was very warm, the king's child went out into the forest and sat down by the side of the cool fountain, and when she was bored, she took a golden ball and threw it up on high and caught it, and this ball was her favorite plaything. Now it so happens that on one occasion, the princess's golden ball did not fall into the little hand which she was holding up for it, but onto the ground beyond and rolled straight into the water. The king's daughter followed it with her eyes, but it vanished, and the well was deep, so deep that the bottom could not be seen. At this she began to cry, and cried louder and louder, and could not be comforted. And as she thus lamented, someone said to her, What ails you, king's daughter? Your tears would melt a heart of stone. She looked round to the side where the voice came, and saw a frog stretching forth its thick, ugly head from the water. "'Ah, old water splasher, is it you?' said she. "'I am weeping for my golden ball, which has fallen into the well.' "'Be quiet and do not weep,' answered the frog. "'I can help you, but what will you give me if I bring your plaything up again?' "'Whatever you will have, dear frog,' said she. "'My clothes, my pearls and jewels, and even the golden crown which I am wearing.' The frog answered, I do not care for your clothes, your pearls and jewels, or your golden crown. But if you will love me and let me be your companion and playmate, and sit by you at your little table, and eat off your little golden plate, and drink out of your little cup and sleep in your little bed, if you will promise me this, I will go down below and bring you your golden ball up again. Oh yes, said she, I promise you all you wish, if you will but bring me my ball back again. She, however, thought, how the silly frog does talk. He lives in the water with the other frogs, and croaks, he could be no companion to any human being. But the frog, when he had received this promise, put his head into the water and sank down, and in a short while came swimming up again with the ball in his mouth, and threw it on the grass. The king's daughter was delighted to see her pretty plaything once more, and picked it up and ran away with it. Wait, wait, said the frog, take me with you, I cannot run as you can. But what did it avail him to scream his croak, croak after her as loudly as he could? She did not listen to it, but ran home and soon forgot the poor frog, who was forced to go back into his well again. 
The next day, when she had seated herself at table with the king and all his courtiers, and was eating from her little golden plate, something came creeping, splish, splash, splish, splash, up the marble staircase, and when it had got to the top, it knocked at the door and cried, Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. She ran to see who was outside, but when she opened the door, there sat the frog in front of it. Then she slammed the door in great haste, sat down to dinner again, and was quite frightened. The king saw plainly that her heart was beating violently, and said, My child, what are you so afraid of? Is there perchance a giant outside who wants to carry you away? Ah, uh, no, replied she. It is no giant, but a disgusting frog. What does a frog want with you? Ah, dear father, yesterday as I was in the forest sitting by the well, playing, my golden ball fell into the water, and because I cried so, the frog brought it out again for me, and because he so insisted, I promised him he should be my companion, but never thought he would be able to come out of his water, and now he is outside there, and wants to come into me. In the meantime, it knocked a second time, and cried, Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Do you not know what you said to me yesterday by the cool waters of the fountain? Princess, youngest princess, open the door for me. Then said the king, That which you have promised you must perform. Go and let him in. She went and opened the door, and the frog hopped in and followed her, step by step to her chair. There he sat and cried, Lift me up beside you. She delayed, until at last the king commanded her to do it. When the frog was once on the chair, he wanted to be on the table, and when he was on the table, he said, Now push your little golden plate nearer to me, that we may eat together. She did this, but it was easy to see that she did not do it willingly. The frog enjoyed what he ate, but almost every mouthful she took choked her. At length he said, I have eaten and am satisfied. Now I am tired. Carry me into your little room and make your little silken bed ready. Then we will both lie down and go to sleep. The king's daughter began to cry, for she was afraid of the cold frog, which she did not like to touch, and which now was asleep in her pretty clean little bed. But the king grew angry and said, He who helped you when you were in trouble ought not to be despised by you afterwards. So she took hold of the frog with two fingers, carried him upstairs, and put him in a corner. But when she was in bed, he crept to her and said, I am tired. I want to sleep as well as you. Lift me up or I'll tell your father. Then she was terribly angry, and took him up and threw him with all her might against the wall. Now you'll be quite odious frog, said she. But when he fell down, there was no frog but a king's son with beautiful kind eyes. And it came to pass that, with her father's consent, he became her dear companion and husband. He told her how he had been bewitched by a wicked witch, how no one could have delivered him from the well but herself, and that tomorrow they would go together into his kingdom. Then they went to sleep, and next morning, when the sun awoke them, a carriage came driving up with eight white horses, which had white ostrich feathers on their heads, and were harnessed with golden chains, and behind stood the young king's servant, Faithful Henry. Faithful Henry had been so unhappy when his master was changed into a frog, that he had caused three iron bands to be laid around his heart, lest it should burst with grief and sadness. The carriage was to conduct the young king into his kingdom. Faithful Henry helped them both in, and placed himself behind again, and was full of joy because of this deliverance. And when they had driven a part of the way, the king's son heard a cracking behind him, as if something had broken. So he turned round and cried, Henry, the carriage is breaking. No, master, it is not the carriage. It is banned from my heart, which was put there in my great pain when you were a frog and imprisoned in a well. Again and once again, while they were on their way, something cracked, and each time the king's son thought the carriage was breaking. But it was only the bands which were springing from the heart of faithful Henry, because his master was set free and was happy. The end. So this one should be pretty familiar. I mean, the whole frog prince type thing. Like, it's a pretty familiar story idea. Obviously, you can see there are some pretty big differences in the original one from what you might have been expecting it to be like. Like, for example, um, she doesn't kiss the frog to turn him back. She uh, splats the frog to turn him back. So I guess I guess the moral here, instead of kiss, go kiss amphibians, it's go splat amphibians, which I do not endorse. I do not agree with. Please don't don't splat amphibians. And don't kiss, don't kiss amphibians either. This leave them alone. They're they've got a rough enough time, as as they are. As far as other differences go, we've also got faithful Henry, who's kind of weird in the story. Like it feels like he was inserted in, 
And honestly, this feels like two stories sort of grew together and became one. Because, you know, you've got frog stuff, frog stuff, frog stuff, frog stuff. Oh, print stuff, Faithful Henry. And it doesn't really jive with the rest of the story. But let's move on to more specific stuff now. We're going to do a more in-depth cross-analysis of of the story. So, first off, the opening lines uh, are pretty interesting. It's them, you know, in old times, da-da-da. And so this is sort of like the once upon a time that we're used to, but, you know, different because it's different words. But same general idea. And this is, you know, recorded way back in olden days. So sort of, it's an interesting reminder of how everybody has always had this idea that, like, back in the day things were more magical and more fun and more romantic. And so I think now, like, you know, like, medieval times are super popular. Everyone's like, ah, oh, yeah, it was, that's the, that's the jam. But it's also like that in the Renaissance, and then in med- actual medieval times, they're all like, oh, hell yeah, Roman times are where it's at. And the Romans probably thought they were top shit, but, you know, you see the idea where people have always romanticized the past, and honestly, people haven't changed very much in the past few thousand years. Like, if you... One of my favorite things is if you check out online the graffiti they found at Pompeii, it's basically the same stuff you find now. Like it was, you know, Gaius Antiquilus was here, or, you know, Maximus Pontificus has a big dick, or, you know, it's the same stuff. And also just drawings of dicks in general, it's all the same stuff as there is now, so... Really, that's one thing that's important to keep in mind when you're looking at people of the past, is they're just like people are now. We, we haven't changed. We're all the same. Another thing this story sort of highlights is the sexism of the time, especially with princesses, because historically, princesses were basically pawns, and princes too, like royal kids were pawns for their parents, but princesses especially so were diplomatic bartering chips. And this does sort of reflect that, like, some random frog shows up, and her dad basically forces her to be best buds with this kind of creepy frog. Like, the frog is pretty, pretty creepy. And there is this whole moral of, you know, don't go back on your word and stuff, but the way it's presented is, uh, not, not the best. And there's one thing we're gonna have to keep in mind throughout all the stories we look at, is that... Back in the the olden days, people were they were pretty awful. You know, people just sort of sucked back then. I mean, they suck now too, but they sucked generally more back then. Uh, back before there were things like rights. Now, one more interesting thing about the story concept in general is that the idea of a frog prince or of some royal person being turned into a frog is actually. A pretty common one. You'll find different variations of this folk story from all around Europe. And also similar ideas from Sri Lanka and from Korea. So for some reason, it's just this universal human idea that princes and princesses get turned into frogs. Which, I mean, frogs are pretty great. Like, they look pretty damn regal. But, I mean, they're also they're also frogs. I mean... You know, like, if I was turning a prince into something, I'd turn it into an ant, probably, because, you know, ants can't really talk, and they're in, like, the the whole hive mind thing. And also, who's going to listen to an ant? Like, frogs, they command respect. Ants, they don't command nothing. They're commanded by the queen. Also, being turned into a frog would be, it wouldn't be so bad, you know? Because, like, if you're some royal person, you know, you've got all these responsibilities and rules you got to do. And those suck. And then you get turned into a frog. You just get around to get to splash around in the water and eat bugs. And, you know, it's a good it's a good time. It's a good time. Maybe not the eating bugs part. That's less good. But the splashing around in the water, like, goddamn, that's the dream right there. Like, if I could get paid just to hang out in a pond all day, like, sign me up right there. But I think that's enough for now about frogs and princes. I think we should move on to the next story. This is number two in the Brothers Grimm collection. This one is called Cat and Mouse in Partnership. 
A certain cat had made the acquaintance of a mouse, and had said so much to her about the great love and friendship she felt for her, that at length the mouse agreed that they should live and keep house together. But we must make a provision for winter, or else we shall suffer from hunger, said the cat, and you, little mouse, cannot venture everywhere, or you'll be caught in a trap some day. The good advice was followed, and a pot of fat was bought, but they did not know where to put it. At length, after much consideration, the cat said, I know no place where it will be better stored up than in the church, for no one dares take anything away from there. We will set it beneath the altar, and not touch it until we are really in need of it. So the pot was placed in safety, but it was not long before the cat had a great yearning for it, and said to the mouse, I want to tell you something, little mouse. My cousin has brought a little son into the world, and has asked me to be godmother. He is white with brown spots, and I am to hold him over the font at christening. Let me go out today, and you look after the house by yourself. Yes, yes, answered the mouse. By all means go, and if you get anything very good, think of me. I should like a drop of sweet red christening wine too. All this, however, was untrue. The cat had no cousin, and had not been asked to be godmother. She went straight to the church, stole to the pot of fat, began to lick at it, and licked the top of the fat off. Then she took a walk upon the roofs of the town, looked out for opportunities, and then stretched herself in the sun and licked her lips whenever she thought of the pot of fat. It was not until evening did she return home. Well, here you are again, said the mouse. No doubt you have had a merry day. Oh, went off well, answered the cat. What name did they give the child? Top off, said the cat quite coolly. Top off, cried the mouse. That is a very odd and uncommon name. Is it a usual one in your family? What does it matter, said the cat. It is no worse than crumb stealer, as your godchildren are called. Before long, the cat was seized by another fit of longing. She said to the mouse, You must do me a favor, and once more manage the house for a day alone. I am asked again to be godmother, and as the cat has a white ring round its neck, I cannot refuse. The good mouse consented. The cat crept behind the town walls to the church and devoured half the pot of fat. Nothing ever seems so good as what one keeps to oneself, said she, and was quite satisfied with her day's work. But when she went home, the mouse inquired, And what was this child christened? Half done, answered the cat. Half done? What are you saying? I've never heard the name in my life. I'll wager anything it is not in the calendar of saints. The cat's mouth soon began to water for some more licking. All good things go in threes, said she. I am asked to stand godmother again. The child is quite black, only has white paws, but with that exception, it is not a single white hair on its whole body. This only happens once every few years. You will get let me go, won't you? Top off, half done, answered the mouse. There are such odd names, they make me very thoughtful. You sit at home, said the cat, in your dark grey fur coat and long tail, and are filled with fancies. That's because you do not go out in the daytime. During the cat's absence, the mouse cleaned the house and put it in order, but the greedy cat entirely emptied the pot of fat. When everything is eaten up, one has some peace, said she to herself, and well filled and fat, she did not return home till night. The mouse at once asked what name had been given to the third child. It will not please you more than the others, said the cat. He is called All Gone. All Gone, cried the mouse. That is the most suspicious name of all. I have never seen it in print. All gone, what can that mean? And she shook her head, curled herself up, and laid down to sleep. From this time forth, no one invited the cat to be godmother, but when the winter had come, and there was no longer anything to be found outside, the mouse thought of their provision and said, Come, cat, we will go to our pot of fat, which has been stored up for ourselves. We shall enjoy that. Yes, answered the cat. You will enjoy it as much as you would enjoy sticking that dainty tongue of yours out of the window. They set out on their way, but when they arrived, the pot of fat certainly was still in its place, but it was empty. Alas, said the mouse, now see what has happened, now it comes to light, you are a true friend. You devoured all when you were standing godmother, first top off, then half done, then... Will you hold your tongue, cried the cat, one word more and I will eat you too. All gone, was already on the poor mouse's lips. Scarcely had she spoken it before the cat sprang on her, seized her, and swallowed her down. And that is the way of the world. The end. So this one is a wild ride. Holy shit. Like, I'm guessing most of you probably haven't heard of the story before or heard it. But also, I imagine most of you heard the title, Cat and Mouse in Partnership, and went, Oh, I wonder where this is going. 
So pretty predictable ending. Also, this sort of ties in with medieval values or even modern values of um, life sucks and then you die. You know, even even as at the end, you know, that's the way of the world. And it's especially true for medieval times when it generally is life sucks and then you die. You know, when you're four years old because the king of Denmark decided to sacrifice you to Odin or whatever. You know, it was a rough time back then, and I suppose when you're a little kid, you know, you gotta learn that pretty quick, because the king of Denmark, he's coming for you, and, you know, he's got his sacrificial battle axe ready and on hand, so you better watch out, kid. Uh, this one is also a great example of the folk story, fairy tale theme of anthropomorphizing anth- anth- human-like animals. <laughs> Um, you've got this cat and mouse who basically live, like, a normal-ass life, just going about their business, but also they're animals, and they sort of live in the human world, but that's not really addressed. So a weird point with these fairy tales, there's a lot of suspension of disbelief, like, they sort of exist to do their thing, and you just have to accept that, and accept the story and the idea behind it. This one is honestly pretty straightforward. It's, you know, if you're too trusting jerks will screw you over and that's just how it goes it is a lot more brutal for kids stories than today's standards are you know if if we had that today it'd be like the hungry hungry caterpillar gets eaten by birds which you know that'd be a no-go like you just traumatize all your kids it's like that the dinosaur book as um the all my friends are dead one it's like reading that to your kid and they just are absolutely miserable because you know it's like oh r.i.p but this is definitely one of the b-list or even c-list of the grimm's fairy tales like you're not going to see any big budget musicals being made out of this one there's really that not that much to work with and honestly that's i don't really have anything else to say about it like it's a whack story speaks truth don't trust cats if you're a mouse boom There we go. So that's all I've got for this first episode. We did it. Woo. If you enjoyed this, I I hope you enjoyed this. Um, If you did, I should be making another one that should come up at some point. Um, It'll probably be somewhat regular upload schedules as I'm figuring this out. But yeah, if you enjoyed this, please tell all your friends about it and family and sworn blood enemies. And yeah. I've been Kyle, I've been your host, and I will see you next time.